Welcome, everybody. Great to be here with you today here in Bethel. I want to welcome also all of you online today and those in New Milford, Derby, Waterbury, and also up at Greenwich Church in Massachusetts. So good to be worshiping together. Last week, we kicked off our sermon series called The, the Abundant Life, uh, and Crystal kicked that off so well. And, and just to remind you, the abundant life is what it looks like to arise and shine. That's how I think about it. It's, it's what it actually, if you were to look at someone and say, oh, that person is living the abundant life, you, you could say, that's because they've, ar- they've ar- arised and they are shining. Crystal asked the question, do you want your best year ever? It's a great question to ask at the beginning of the year. And then she gave us some, some great building blocks of what that could look like. She said, choose surrender. Surrender all of yourself to Jesus. Seek the Lord passionately with all of your life and submit to him. Make him the Lord of your life. Actually do what he commands you to do. Commit your life to him. You know, Adam and I, uh, when we were dreaming about this sermon series many months ago, um, we found ourselves reflecting on the fact that God's desire for all of us is to experience the, the abundant life for every single one of us. So just let that set in for a second. For you this morning, for you online, he wants you to experience the abundant life. Abundant life, there's no question about that. We look across culture and we see that this concept of you know, wanting to experience the abundant life is, is found in every culture. I've been to Costa Rica a couple of times and they like to say pura vida, which means the pure life. In Italy, they talk about la dolce vita, the sweet life. And you can find terms like this in really every culture. There's this innate, deep down within us, desire to live life to the full, isn't there? We can find it in anyone that we speak to. But true abundant life, friends, is found only in Jesus. It really is found only in Jesus. For those who speak Spanish today, uh, I'm going to try my best to say the abundant life in Spanish. La vida abundante. Can we try it together? La vida abundante. I got coached, so I I think I'm pretty close. (laughs) That's the abundant life in Spanish. And Jesus came, up, came to offer us that abundant life, life to the full, to every single one of us. And how, how apropos that tomorrow we, we really thank God for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Because he, he really shared this vision with us that every single person should be treated with the knowledge that he or she was made in the image of God. And that vision was, was founded on the biblical principles that have led Walnut Hill to really want to focus in on being a body of believers of every age, gender, ethnicity, race, ability, and gifting who move from inclusion to belonging to becoming family together. That's our statement of what it means for us as Walnut Hill Community Church to become a place where everyone is able to take those steps to becoming family in Christ. Where does that come from? It comes from Revelation chapter 7, 9 and 10. So we're not finding this, it's easy to find in scripture, but this passage here at the end of our scriptures helps us to understand why we would even care about such a thing. Where we see a a multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. What a vision that we get to look forward to in eternity. That we get to taste just a bit of it when we come to church on a Sunday But ultimately, that's what we're going to experience. People from every tribe, tongue, nation, praising the Lord together. So the abundant life, if you don't believe it yet, hopefully you will by the end of the day, is for all of us. It's not the deluxe version of Christianity. But there are so many obstacles that want to steal the abundant life from us. Crystal started telling us about that last week. And I want to talk a little bit about that today as well. Let me start out with a riddle. See if you can find out if you can remember maybe where you've heard this before. This thing, all things devours. Birds, beasts, trees, flowers. Gnaws iron, bites steel, grinds hard stones to meal. Slays king, ruins town, and beats high mountain down. It's a little depressing. Do you know what, it, what the riddle is, what, what the answer is? Who's ever watched The Hobbit? Gollum speaks these words. And I said to Adam, I bet you no one in church history at Walnut Hill has ever quoted Gollum from The Hobbit. So I'm the first today. The answer is time. 
time. Think about it later if you didn't get a chance to take it all in. But time is what devours all things and gnaws at us and takes us all in the end. And time is a topic that artists have been focused on really forever. And I can prove it to you by just rattling off a few song titles that you will probably recognize some of them with a little explanation to each one. The first is this, Too Much Time on My Hands by Styx. Nothing to do all day long. It's the plight of the successful rock band. Woe is them, huh? <laughs> we, would, we wouldn't mind a little bit of that every once in a while. Too much time on our hands. How about Time is on My Side? The Rolling Stones covered it. And really what they're saying is, I've got all the time in the world. I'll wait. She'll come back. No arrogance there, Mick. Come on. Time after time. How about Time after time by Cindy Lauper? She's waiting no matter what for her, her love to return. Does anyone really know what time it is by Chicago? They're saying slow down. Don't miss what's important. Sign of the Times by Harry Styles. He talks about the passage of time and the hope and the despair that, all, that accompanies time. Sitting on the Dock of the Bay by Otis Redding. Passing lonely hours away. How about Cats in the Cradle by Harry Chapin? It's a sad one. He says, we'll do this relationship later, but later never comes. If I could turn back time by Cher. I was so tempted to sing it to you today, but I'm not going to. You all, you all want to sing it right now. Wishing she could go back and fix all the mistakes that she'd made in previous relationship. And then finally, yesterday by the Beatles, the regretting of the breakup of relationships. And again, wishing I could go back and heal those relationships. Time is precious, isn't it? We see it in riddles, we see it in songs, we see it all over our world. It's a gift from God. We know that as believers. And it's important as we look at the abundant life, what we do with our time. Because each of us has a certain amount of time. We don't know how much more we have. And we know what we do with it really matters. We don't want to regret at the end of our time looking back and saying, what did it all mean? What did I do with it? What is it all really added up to? I know that none of us wants to have those experiences at the end of our lives. But, we, but we, before we can even talk about good stewardship of time, it's important to start where the Lord really starts with us, this concept of rest. Rest. And next week we're going to go more into this, the stewardship of time. But I want to start with the command to rest. The word in scripture is, that's used is Sabbath. But I'm going to use rest today because sometimes in church we use these words and we confuse one another. But it's, that's all it's talking about is rest, taking time away from your normal everyday grind and getting rest in the Lord. I have to confess to you this morning that when I looked at the sermon um, schedule and I saw my name attached to this theme, I, I, was, I went and tried to find a guest preacher for today. <laughs> I thought to myself, what do I have to share about this topic when I know that, as Chris Vitarello just confessed as well, I tend to be running around in the rat race quite a bit as well. Now, what happened was the guest preacher couldn't come, so I had to get serious and get down to business and start, and start researching. And then what I found out is actually I do have a few things to share about it, thankfully. If it's true that God commands that we rest Am I obeying that commitment, that commandment? You know, as I thought about this, I have to admit some guilt set in. <laughs> but I know that there's some things that the Lord has taught me over the years and teaches us in Scripture that, that are important for us all to know. And I don't want you to walk away today with how I was feeling when I first tackled this topic. This is not meant to be a guilt-driven sermon in any way. I hope it breaks you free of that guilt. I also want you to know, I'm a work in progress when it comes to these things, and I think we all are. Here's the first thing I want to share with you, and it's really foundational to this topic of Sabbath rest. Rest is a gift from God. Did you know that? It's a gift from God. Not every culture, not every faith focuses and commands rest, but ours does. And we are all tired, aren't we? You might not be today. Maybe you woke up with a little pep in your step, I don't know. But we are all tired at times. 
And when I thought about being tired, my mind immediately went to some of those days in my life where I was like totally weary. Um, I, th- I thought about two of my closest friends, George and Jim, they're brothers. And the three of us have spent countless hours and days and miles on the hiking trails of the Adirondack Mountains. We, the three of us have completed our 46 high peaks of 4,000 feet above over up in uh, New York State. And we've done this for 30 years together. And we, we didn't do it strategically. So we covered way more ground than we ever had to. And we went up and over mountains we didn't need to do because we never intended on doing it in the first place. We were just there having fun. But then we got this goal in mind and we got going. So this past summer, my buddy George and I, the one in the front, and then you know me there, wanted to complete our 46 with the guy in the middle who had a couple more to do. So we had one last hike to do, and it wasn't an easy one. It was going to take us over three peaks and then back over another one. Four peaks, thousands of ele- feet of elevation gain, over 12 miles in, a, in the day. We started very early, and by the end of it, I want to tell you, for me, it was like a death march. I was just barely getting my feet to go one in front of the other. I was slipping and sliding on things I shouldn't have been slipping and sliding on, but it was that level of weariness. And I can tell you, with these two guys, they've seen me at my worst over the years. So what I thought I'd show you is a couple pictures from that experience. This was at the top when we completed. The next one you're going to see is where we're celebrating our 46. And then I want to show you two other pictures and ask you to try to pick up the theme. Here's the first one from this, this hike. We were on our way up. And one more, because now I want you to see if you can find the theme here. Well, a couple themes. Number one, George is always taking the photos. Yes, he was a photographer in the Marines, so he's our photographer. But I'm always at the back, (laughs) always at the back, bringing up the rear. And if I were to show you videos, sometimes I was quite a few minutes in the back, slowly (laughs) coming up. So I can tell you, by the end of these experiences, I'm exhausted Have you ever had that experience? Sometimes it's not physical exhaustion. Sometimes it's mental, emotional exhaustion that you've experienced. But you can probably relate to it where you feel like you can't take another step, either literally or figuratively. We all need rest. Maybe me more than others, apparently. But God's rest on the seventh day after the creation narrative that we see, after that's occurred, He's created for us this rest and rhythm that he wants us to experience because we know that God didn't need to rest. So why is it even in Scripture that he rested on the seventh day? It's there because he knew we would need it. He knew we would need it. He knew that he wanted to create for us a rhythm of life that was healthy for us and that engaged us with him in a powerful way. Now, think about those Israelites in the wilderness wanderings season. They truly believed that rest was coming when they got out of the wilderness and into Canaan. But what did Joshua find when he got there? Giants in the land. That does not sound restful. And you follow the rest of uh, uh, that, that season and you find that it wasn't a restful season. They didn't achieve rest by entering into that land. So what is it that we see in Scripture that's being sought after, and focused on out in the future. We see it ultimately in Jesus Christ, don't we? That's where we begin to see where this rest can truly be found. Because I believe that there's rest that can be found on a day-to-day function, uh, a time frame. Like today, I can find rest. But then there's also a tomorrow that we need to look at. Today, we see it in many scriptures, but I picked out one for you. Jesus' words in John 14, 27, he says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give you is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. See, we, re- we receive this gift from God as we make time for Jesus, as we make time for our relationship with him, as we lean in and build our lives upon the rock of Christ. We can find peace, we can find rest today. Some of you find that on a daily basis in your first 20. May this be a moment for me to plug that type of time with the Lord. It's part of your Sabbath rest that you set aside time every day and you build your life upon the rock, Jesus Christ. And you allow his peace to fill you 
and move within you. That's the peace that we can have for now. But it is temporary because we know that tomorrow something might come. A challenge will ultimately arise. So what is the other part of rest that we can look at? It's the ultimate rest we look forward to. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now, there are many passages we could look at. but This is the one I chose for us today. Now, we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. It's, it's the picture of the view of eternity, ultimate rest. And it comes in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. It comes in our surrender to him, as Crystal so, so nicely set up for us last week. When we surrender to him, we can look forward to this kind of rest that we will ultimately experience in, in the Lord. And that is the gift of the peace of mind that the Lord can give us in Christ Jesus today and that rest that we can look forward to someday. It's good. I hope, do you feel rested as you think about these things this morning? I know I did as I thought about this and, and as I thought about the times when I found rest in the Lord. Let's keep going. Secondly, the thing I wanted to share with you that rest is not just a gift from God, but it also helps us to trust in God. The concept of a day of rest in the Old Testament was that for six days you're going to work, okay? You're going to work hard. Even your animals are going to work hard for six days. But those six days are going to provide for seven. God's economy, it's good, isn't it? And again, in many cultures, in many faith uh, uh, religions, this concept of rest does not exist. But from the very beginning, it was set up for you and me. Now, it's one thing to rest in the Lord when all, all is well. But when, th when things are more difficult, when the storms of life come, it's, it's hard to take time to rest. Sometimes we'll think we've got to work that extra day. We have to keep going. Our mind has to keep being engaged. Otherwise, it's not going to all work out for us. Think about, again, the wilderness wanderings. The Israelites are in the wilderness, and there's another example here that's such a powerful one about the way the Lord provides. Six days work provides for seven days with the manna from heaven, right? Do you remember this story? Every day they would wake up in the wilderness and there was this, some sort of food that was on the ground that they would go and gather and they would make it into bread and it provided for them every single day. Now in the beginning of this whole experience, the Lord said, you know, pick up just enough for today. So what did the people do? Hoarded as much as they possibly could. After they ate what they ate that day, what, what, ha what happened to the stuff they had stored overnight? Rotten, totally rotten, except for one day a week where they would pick up enough for two days and it wouldn't rot. What is the Lord telling them? I provide for you. You're not providing for yourself. It's not about you having to gather. It's about me providing for you. What I provide in six days will cover the seven. And it's the same is true today. The same is true today. We, we can trust the Lord that even though we rest, he's going to provide for us. Now, this created for them, the people, a healthy rhythm, a godly lifestyle, and time for relationships. And I want to talk about two types of relationships. The first one is the relationship with God. Now, some of you have had the, the, the joy of traveling to Israel, and um, I've gotten to go with many of you. And I want to just warn you, if you go to Israel on Saturday, which is the, the Jewish Sabbath, be careful which elevator you get on. Because if you are wanting to go down to the first floor and you're on the second floor and you notice that the elevator is pointing up, if you get on that elevator, you're going to go to every floor up to the very top, stopping at each floor with the doors opening and closing. And then it will start to return back down. And so you just took about 10 minutes to go one flight of stairs. Why? Because they're taking so seriously the command not to work. On, a, on the Sabbath. They don't want to press the button. They can't press the button. So they, they're either walking or they're taking the long ride down. Now for those of us non-Jews, we can take the other elevator, but pick the right one. That's important on the Sabbath. Why do I share this with you? Well, I think that 
in this scenario, what, what's being forgotten is the vertical relationship that we're supposed to be going after. The Sabbath is an opportunity to imitate God, be image bearers of God, enact that eternal rest that's to come. It's not, just a, it's not about following a certain amount of rules to the T. It's not, it's not religion that the Lord is after when it comes to the Sabbath. Even in the Old Testament days, it was not about just following the rules and regulations perfectly. So as, they, as you get on the Sabbath elevator and you don't press a button, it's possible, I think, you're missing some of the point of the relationship that the Lord is actually after. Not about whether I press a button or not. How do I know this? Well, we see again many scriptures, but even in the Old Testament, this was the, what the Lord wanted. He didn't just want you to simply, mindlessly follow certain rules. Micah 6, 8 is one of my favorite passages about this. It says, O people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. There's no sense here of legalism, is there? It's all about relationship with the Lord. The Old Testament God is the same God as we have in the New Testament. We just get to see in Jesus how God is played out in the form of man, which helps us so much. But it's the same, this is the same Abba Father, Old Testament and New Testament. And his, he's always been about our hearts, friends. Always been about wanting our hearts. Look now at Jesus. This is one of the wonderful stories that we see in the Gospels. Jesus is in the fields with his disciples on the Sabbath day. What are the, they're hungry. What do the disciples do? They start picking grain. I want to tell you, the disciples broke the law three times in this one act. They harvested by picking the grain. They worked by gr grinding the grain to get the seeds that they could actually eat. And then they, they uh, sinned by winnowing and blowing away the chaff. And of course, then they ate something that they had just harvested. And what do the Pharisees do? They lose their minds about this. And they, they say to Jesus, how would you let these disciples of yours work on the Sabbath? Jesus goes into a, a story about David and how he comes and actually eats on the Sabbath and takes the holy bread to eat. And here's what Jesus says ultimately. This is the point that he tries to make to us in Mark 22, uh, 23 to 28, but I'm focusing on verse 27 and 28. He says, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Here's, here's how I would put it. You're missing the point of this commandment to rest if you think that it's about if you think it's about you having to do the things to fulfill the Sabbath, the Sabbath is there as a gift to you, a gift to us to, to commune and commit and connect to our Lord. It's not about checking the box. It's about relationship. Do you know that God cares more about what's happening in your heart, in my heart, than what I do out of a sense of obligation? He's always cared more about that. He wants you to have this abundant life, la vida abundante. He knows that it starts with you trusting in him and building a relationship with him, building upon the rock, and he knows that it takes time to do it, and he wants us to set aside that time. He also knows, see, I, I have to tell you, when I was thinking, as, as, a, as a young person thinking about the Sabbath, I always thought the Sabbath meant I had to find a place in my house and just be alone all day long. I want to tell you, that's not what we find in Scripture at all. There's, a pla there's places we do need to be still and be alone, but it's not the only thing that the Sabbath is about. If you like to think of Sunday as your Sabbath, part of it's about being together. It's about being in relationship with one another. It's about stopping all the other stuff that we do during the week and gaining perspective by being in the presence of God and being in the presence of others to focus on what he's doing in and through us. So relationship with one another is key when it comes to rest. There's this vertical, yes, but there's also this horizontal to rest and commune together. In fact, the word sabistimos is the word that's used here in the Hebrews passage that we read, and it talks about a festive, joyful celebration, which requires people, doesn't it? I've never festively celebrated by myself. 
It's about being together and celebrating the Sabbath together, celebrating the Lord together, worshiping together, enjoying the presence of the people. Joyful relationship, celebration, food even, all, can all be part of our Sabbath. There's more than one way. That's, that's where I want to leave us today, friends. There's more than one way to celebrate the Sabbath. How do I know this? Well, Paul really sets it up well for us in the book of Romans. He says, there's no second-class Christians because of what you do or you don't do when it comes to the days of the week and the things that you set aside or don't set aside. Romans 14, 5 and 6 says, in the same way, some think one day is more holy than another, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor him. And then verse 10, skipping down. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on, one an on another believer? Remember, we will stand before the judgment seat of God. Let me just give you a little brief history of what's going on here. There's this Jew-Gentile um, problem that's happening in the early Christian church. The Jewish Christians are saying, what do these Gentiles need to do to be in? That's ultimately how I would describe what was happening. And some were arguing, well, they need to become Jews. Everything that goes along with it, they need to, that's what needs to happen. In fact, that kind of argument didn't go away until the Jewish Christians got kicked out of the synagogues and out of the temple at some point in, in that first century which is too bad that it, 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 it took that to get to that place. But what Paul and the leaders of the church were saying, and we can see this again in Acts and other places, they're saying, no, we need to make it simple to come to Jesus. Jesus made it simple to come to him. We don't need to put in more challenges for people to meet Jesus, fall, fall in love with him, and, and, and follow him with their lives. We wanna make this really easy. And so Paul is sum, uh, summarizing it in this passage saying, hey, Let's not make it about days and about different foods and about different customs and things that we've done our whole lives. No, we want to make the experience simple. So where does that leave you and me when it comes to this concept of rest and Sabbath? I want to just share with you a few takeaways, I hope. And I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up now. The abundant life, let me remind you, it's for everyone. It's for you. Everyone listening online, it's for you. What will you do with the time he's giving you, given you? That's the question that we ask ourselves, I believe, when we step into that rest and, and work rhythm with the Lord. God wants to meet with you. I've asked you this before, but if you knew that the God of the universe wanted to meet with you, what would you do to provide that time to meet with him? It's a gift he's giving you, that he wants to meet with you and spend time with you. He wants you to set aside time to meet with him. So part of your rest Work rhythm should be that first 20, that time that you spend with him, the best minutes of your day, wherever they fit with you. But then there's also this reality that we need to stop sometimes and put aside our, you know, the rat race of life, the things that we have to do every single day. Why? Why do we do that? It's to gain perspective, friends. I thought a little bit about this for myself. Man, I gotta tell you, like all of you, during a busy week, when I have many, many things to do, both in my church life and my family life and everything else that comes up, I lose perspective on what really matters, often, just like you do. The Sabbath is meant, the, the rest is meant for me to get back on track. Understand my, you know, ultimately that I can have rest now, but that I have this rest to come. I tell you, that helps me when I'm stressed about finances. You know, how am I gonna pay for you know, three kids going through college, or when I'm stressed about my car is breaking down, which it was this week. Thank you so much for that. When, I, when, I'm, when I'm feeling the pressure of, uh, you know, what's happening in my work environment, you have these experiences too. The Lord wants this time to realign you with him, that you might be able to walk with him the rest of the six days of the week. And again, I use the, seven, uh, the seventh day. I don't think it matters that much how you set this up, because scripture tells us, it's not a legalistic thing. You, you figure out in your season what works for you. Some of you could actually set it aside an entire day because of the season of life that you're in 
And that might be exactly what the Lord's calling you to. Do it. Some of you have young families, and you know that that's not possible right now. But you still have to find time to find that work and rest rhythm. Because the Lord wants to meet with you. He wants to connect with you. He wants you to build your life upon him. There's no prescription for rest, friends. But there's a gift of rest that the Lord wants you to receive. There's a need to stop working and running and trust God that he will provide. God's economy is that six days will provide for seven. And often, five days will provide for seven. The Lord's so good to us. He wants to do this in our lives. And there's this highly relational component of rest where we are re-engaging with the Lord. We are reconnecting with the Lord. We are reconnecting with one another and experiencing something that we can't always experience because of the world we live in and the challenges that we face. There's a rest and work rhythm that honors God and it grows us into this abundant life. And we want you to have it because the Lord wants you to have it. I want to have it more because the Lord wants me to have it. So what is he saying to you today? We're going to have a chance to reflect. This isn't one of those sermons where I'm giving you the five ways to have Sabbath rest. This really is one of those moments where you have to say, Lord, what are you saying to me? What does it look like for me to do this well? To do this well with you? What does it look like? And it could look very different for different ones of us. And I just want to encourage you to find that work rest rhythm because it's so good for your relationship with him, with one another, and it's so good for what he wants to do in and through you, which I know Adam will take us further on next week in that concept because there's also an outward component of when we are rested and empowered and filled up that he wants to use us in the lives of others. So I want to pray for us now, and we're going to go into a song of worship. We picked a song that is gives us an opportunity to reflect quite a bit. Think about the Lord in our lives. I want to encourage you to ask God to speak to you today. Maybe even point out to you those places where there's some change that needs to occur. Maybe he he may want to say to you, well done, keep going. I'm not sure what he's going to say to you, but I'm I'm sure he wants to speak to you and help you in in this area. I know he does for me. I know he did for me as I prepared this today. It's so good when he does that. Even as we try to teach others, we're being taught by our Lord. He's so good in that relationship with us. So will you stand with me? I want to pray for us as we go into worship and ask him just to speak to us now as we worship him and we turn to him. So Lord, we thank you so much that you have given us this great gift and it is an incredible gift to know that you have commanded us to to rest but not just because you want us to feel obligated, but because you want us to trust in you and experience you and grow in relationship with you and with others. Lord, you, you have purposes for this time that you have for us. You want us to use our time for, for the sake of your kingdom. So Lord, will you speak to us now? We just ask you to come and work and move and give us insight into the things that we need to do, the steps we may need to take and Lord, even if, maybe even put our minds a person who could help us on that journey if we're really struggling. Lord, you can do it. I pray you would. We thank you so much that you speak to, you really do speak to us. And we trust you will now in Jesus' name. Amen.